Hello and welcome to On the Record, the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. This is our final show for the season, and in keeping with our commitment to keep the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian going, we here at RTV are going to continue with that tonight. We came here on the air as the storm approached in September, and we made a commitment to keep you informed. Once the all clear was given, we decided that everything from that point on would focus on the recovery. As we prepare to wrap up our third season, we want to revisit some of those moments that touched us the most in our post-storm coverage. From initial reports, we knew the situation in the Haitian communities of Pigeon Peas and the Mud and Abaco were the worst. Cameraman Taran Knowles and I caught a ride into Marsh Harbor and visited Ground Zero one day as the sun was about to set. Well, more tonight on the carnage left in Abaco, an island that was once a busy center of commerce is now a disaster zone. The moment you walk into the Marsh Harbor Airport, you get a sense of the panic-stricken passengers who would have passed through. The security systems, services, and general order abandoned. The outside provides the first glimpse of the damage yet to come. Cars are battered, some dislodged and transplanted, like matchbox toys at the hands of a toddler. But this is no child's play. A left turn out of the airport into the main Marsh Harbor is jaw-dropping. Every building, space, business, home and meeting place ripped apart. Entire roofs gone. Portions of buildings dismantled. Tangled pieces of siding, steel beams, and blown out windows and doors. Remnants of a once thriving, prosperous, and bustling family island community. Now, only an eerie silence of passing vehicles and faint voices. We stop in the Haitian community known as Pigeon Peas in the Mud. A man who once lived inside this now twisted mangle guides my team and I inside. This is the mud. Yes. And this is the main road into the mud. Main road, yeah. One here, this side, more, one more wood on this side. The wood. By the dock. Where did these containers come from? All the dock. They're from the dock? All the dock. That's why all that damn is making me. I have to come from the dock. It's clean. That's what it is. Wow. All them people sitting there, that hard and here, this big, big, big. You know? And you stayed here? I watch him watch my eye. You watch this happen? Well, I watch you. I don't want to buy all the rich You went there? Yeah. I watch everything. I need to just come. I can come out. You can come out. If I can um, come out, get out, I might be. How many? How many, how long, how many hours? For the whole game? You know, how, how long, how many hours you stayed in the hurricane? Uh, uh, look, all day! All day! All day! All day! It wasn't long before the scent of decomposing bodies hit me. Obviously familiar with the terrain, our guide led the way through mounds of rubble. We struggled to keep pace. Any wrong step could mean an injury all around the possessions of former residents. The scene is overwhelming, destruction as far as the eye can see. There are bodies in plain view waiting to be retrieved, while beneath, the scent indicates more and more tragedies yet unaccounted for. At times, we found ourselves stuck, unsure of how to move forward. U.S. Armed Forces helicopters buzz overhead, obviously curious at our activities. As we head out, a woman leaning up on a truck looks on at the place she once called home. Reluctantly, eventually, she talks. You know people who died in here? I don't know. Family or? Yeah. Some of your family is there? I don't know. 
Finally, we leave the valley of death, once known as pigeon peas in the mud. But just a few feet down the road, an astounding sight greets us. A steel hull vessel lodged on the side of the Scotiabank building. Evidence of the power unleashed here. If you ever visited Marsh Harbour, you would know this area. It was busy for a family island. A lot of commerce was concentrated here. But now, a wrecked and twisted mass of buildings, vehicles, boats, and possibly more bodies. When we come back, our year in review continues with a look at our first visit to Eastern Grand Bahama. Jesse? Avery? Can the spirit of Christmas bring a chart-topping duo back together? Wouldn't Be Christmas is still the most requested song at all my concerts. I avoid our songs as much as I do. Sing with me. Jamie Rose and Rome Flynn star in A Christmas Duet. Only on Our TV. And welcome back to our season closer of On The Air. Hurricane Dorian is not only the greatest tragedy of this year, nothing in our recent history can compare to the death and destruction left in the wake of this Category 5 storm. For nearly two days, the people of Grand Bahama endured the worst possible conditions in this storm. In this recap, my same cameraman, Taran Knowles, and I made the first journey into East and Grand Bahama. Here's a look back at what we found. John Keats once wrote that nothing ever becomes real till it's experienced. You begin to experience the reality of life in Grand Bahama the moment you touch down at the airport. A waiting tour bus gives you a short ride to an off-site location where you officially disembark and collect your luggage. Signs of life slowly returning to the downtown Freeport area will give you the illusion of an island on the road to recovery. But take a short ride to East End and gives you yet another harsh dose of reality. Downed power lines mingled with snapped poles and transformers, a glimpse into a very different reality. By the time you get to stat oil, the gravity of the damage sets in. Oil from storage tanks spray the surrounding landscape. From the tankers to the ground to the trees, it's all splattered black. What appears to be some form of work assessment or cleanup crews are fanned out around the property. There's clearly a lot to do here. We journeyed on. We had heard that McLean's town was ground zero for Grand Bahama. If it isn't, it's a close second. The imagery is startling. The area, a wasteland. Mounds of debris greet you on both sides of the road. Destroyed and badly damaged vehicles litter the landscape. Most homes are blown apart. The furniture which once belonged inside these homes now lay damaged, broken, and unusable. Government buildings, schools, businesses all bear the markings of 200 plus mile per hour winds. Few homes are inhabitable. The only sounds are heavy equipment and clear debris. Liam Slorlings of Community Organized Relief Effort Corps hopes they can begin to bring a sense of normalcy. We've worked in, uh, we've, we've got a long-standing program in Haiti as a JPHRO, and we've worked up and down the, the east coast of the U.S. after hurricanes and in Puerto Rico and Antigua and Barbuda. Um, and so we're here, out here doing a, a debris removal program, um, just trying to get as much of this stuff out of McLeanstown as we can, because uh, we believe that, uh, you know, really, Clearing this stuff out of the way is the first step to helping these people, you know, build back in a more resilient manner and the first step to recovery. 
And so far, how long have you, well, how long have you been here, I would say? And then what types of stuff have you been removing? I mean, to look around, there's just debris everywhere, all sizes. I mean, how do you begin? What do you move? Okay, so we've been focusing on the debris removal program. Um, just, uh, we started last week with, uh, with Walk Construction, um, who we've hired out to, to do this. Um, and before that, we were running, we, we did some stuff on Abaco. Uh, we had a mobile search and rescue team um, that kind of transitioned into a mobile clinic stuff. We worked in a, you know, some of the communities there that were affected, um, just, just providing whatever aid we could. And then we're here. Um, and as to what stuff we're removing, it's, you know, all the, all the stuff off the side of the road, all the stuff people are hauling out, um, and it just as much as we can, um, with the permission of the property owners and with with everything else that we that we can get out of here, because um, this stuff is in people's way. They need to they need it moved so they can get back and start building their lives again. Is there anything that is different or unique to this disaster uh, versus what you've seen or had to deal with elsewhere? Um, I mean the, the scope. Um, you know, I've seen damage like this elsewhere, but mostly in places where, you know, the building codes were not as good. I mean, and this was a Category 5 storm that just sat on this area, and well, you can see the results. Mm -hmm. So generally, these homes would have been within the building codes, eh? It would appear. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I, I can't say for sure how these would have fared under a weaker storm or a storm that moved on faster. But um, I, I know that the damage that was wrought is, is, is impressive for the quality of construction around here. Mm -hmm. okay. um, in the, as, as you remove the debris from here, where, where does it go? So right now we're staging it just outside of town. Um, you, you probably pass it on the way in and you know, from there it can get moved to wherever the government wants it to be moved but the idea is just getting it out of the way immediately and then its final resting place can be determined at a later point. Sure and you are working with with government agencies to do this? Yes, uh, NEMA knows that we're out here and they know that we're doing this. Um, we've been in, in contact with them for sure. Just to our left we see some activity Henry Carey arrives to his daily reality, a home almost to the point of complete destruction, his possessions few. What was it like um, in this area during the storm? Oh, in this area, I wasn't really here, but I came back after, the, after it was all over. Where did you ride out the storm? Um, by uh, Convention Center, Freeport. And when you got back here and you saw this, what did you think? What did you feel at that point? Oh, well then, I mean, like, I felt like, um, like a part of me was missing, you know? Yeah, it was like sad, you know, and seeing the devastation and stuff, it was just like crazy. I didn't even know where I was, you know, so it made me feel depressed. Have you been able to account for all of your neighbors and family who lived here? Yeah, well, most like my intermediate family, like brothers, sisters, like that. But we had like a couple of cousins and stuff, you know, like they went like in high walk, three, two from here. Yeah, and then that's about it. But my personal family, they was okay. Do you know of anyone um, from this area who's missing or has who has passed away yeah well then um like uh my uh, cousin she married to someone from pelican point they call him george he's still missing and uh it's it's a guy philip right there it's him it's his oldest son and his two ch grandchildren they still missing you know they still missing what are you gonna do now hmm what are you going to do now? You stand here looking around at all of this. What, what's your next step? I don't I thinking about it. What's my next step? I really don't know. Not at this point. I really don't know. Would you rebuild and move back here? Yeah, I, yes, I would. Yep. Why? Huh? Why? Because I love it. Yeah, I'll come back.
I'll come by. What about your neighbors? You think other people will come by? Yeah, I think some folks will come by. You look around and there's so much to do. What would you say is, is most needed right now? Hmm? What is most needed right now? You mean like far as uh, relief? What kind of relief is most needed now? Like water, food, and like most likely shelter. Are you staying nearby here? Are you still living here or are you just coming during the day? No, I just can't come like home. We have a, we build a shack down the street. Just like to sleep overnight, but I still in Freeport for the time being. Yeah, we're trying to get some stuff clean up. We still in Freeport. Soon after, Philip Thomas Sr. appears with his wife. They too come here to begin putting the pieces of their lives back together. Owner of Captain Phil's and Mel's Guide Service, he also operates Sweeting's Fish Camp. His life and livelihood now on pause. Mr. Thomas, this is your house we're standing in front of? Yes, sir. You rode out the storm in here? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What what was that experience like for you, though? Well, we really couldn't hardly see anything because of the wind and the waves. It was like a whiteout. Um, the water was rushing on both sides of the houses, like like the Niagara Fall, you know, we're moving from north to south. I really, I was fortunate. I didn't have that much water. I had less than four feet of water, probably three and a half feet of water in my house, so we was able to ride it out in my walk-in closet for three days. You were in your closet for three days? You and who? Me and my wife and my two kids. Wow. Oh, um, did everyone come through? Yeah, everyone that was in my dwelling, we fared the storm very well. You have any other family members or neighbors who, who are missing or who would have died? I have I have my oldest son and his four and his three grandkids. They were missing. They was unfortunate, but I tried to get him to come here and stay with me, but they choose not to. So. And they were washed out in the in the storm. Yes, sir. They were washed away. How are you making it? Well, I'm I'm making it. I'm surviving. Thank God for life. I really leave this. I really never left the community. I stayed here, I, other than going into Freeport for one or two days to make phone calls, you know, but other than that, making it quite well. You plan to rebuild. I see you have already started. Yes, sir. From day one, pick up the pieces and move on. Some people lose material things. I lose material things, businesses, and life, so nothing they could do. Press on. You think others in the community are going to return? Uh, yeah, they're coming back slowly but surely, bit by bit, you know. So I think I think McLean's down in Sweden Ski are going to be well on their way. I have customers who are prepared to assist in building this community and, and Sweden Ski. So. What kind of business are you involved in? I have a tar company, bone fishing, take people out sightseeing, snorkeling, and stuff like that. You're going to need some help to get restarted. Um, what are you looking or hoping? will happen for you and others in this community. You're a businessman, you live here. What are you hoping for? Well, I, I think I'm well on my way. A lot of my clients have already put stuff together. I, you know, basically, I, I plan to uh, reinforce the house. Um, instead of rock sheet, two by four, I'm gonna build like how you guys build in Nassau. Center blocks, wall to wall, and I'm well on my way. But McLean Town is definitely going to remain your home. Oh, it definitely going to remain my home. Uh, I know that if you notice the sign, it said, we came, we saw, we conquered. And, you know, thanks be to God, I can say we have definitely weathered the storm. I spoke with my granduncle, and he said this was worse than the tide of it. He's in his late 80s, early 90s, and he said this was worse than the tide of it. I think it's in 1929 or 35. Storm which I when it was, but I, I went to the shelter and visited him and he said, this was definitely worse than the tide of air. So, you know, I just can see, I just gotta move on. All right, so thank you and we're sorry for your loss. Yeah, no problem. Okay. I'm sure I, I will overcome it. It won't be easy, but this is my 9-11. <laughs> but he, like so many others, is frustrated by the looting and slow response. They lock up some guys and my son, 
My son, yeah, I'd have went missing. But, you know, I mean, it's unfortunate. They asked us to evacuate. They're going to protect us, but they, they offer no protection for us. None whatsoever. You know? Which is sad. All this, all this la 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 on the radio before the storm and after the storm, they taking weeks to move. You know, that's, that's, that's bad, man. No police presence or defense force presence. They may drive through once in a while, but we need it. We need them at night. This is a one way in and one way out. They, all they got to do is block the road. Why we got to allow people to come all the way from West End or Eight Mile Rock or wherever and move the little we have? So people have really taken advantage of the of the state that you're in. Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people have been taking advantage of the stuff the state that we're in. You know. And, 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 it's, and it's bad. I didn't stay because of material things. Because, you know, I, 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 you know, my life consists not in the abundance of things he have. You know, but I stayed it because I know what I have. My house was built from beans on limited block, which is the best block when the, was the best block at the time. While we, while we buying block for 50 cents, I, I paid a dollar 50 from beans on limited. I have an Alexander. They don't even make them block anymore. They like steel. So other than chipping the columns that are cracked, I, 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 have, I, have, I have a roof over my head. Thank God, you know. But a lot of people don't have a roof over their head, and yet still you have looters coming through and, and, and removing the little that they can salvage, which is bad. Still to come, a visit to one of the keys affected and a conversation with a colleague who has lived this experience with a statement. Screen just freeze. It's a dramatic pause. This portion of On the Record brought to you by Generali, your employee benefit solutions provider. Welcome back. This segment is brought to you by Generali. Hurricane Dorian made landfall in Abaco and Grand Bahama in early September, leaving an unprecedented trail of death and destruction. But these islands are surrounded by a number of keys, which also sustained unimaginable damage. Of all the keys we visited in the aftermath, my technical director, Aiken Barr, and I found Sweeting's Key among the most devastated. Sweeting's Key is only accessible by boat. The nearest staging point is the dock at McLean's Town, which is where we began our trek. But the seabed is now littered with dozens of cars, vehicles tossed into the sea by the storm. For the small boat captains who make a living ferrying passengers back and forth, the journey can be dangerous, with debris littering the shoreline. Any idea how many cars out there? At least about 30 cars. At least about 30? Yeah, you know, down there with the top. Uh-huh. Yeah. Get a load of boats as fast. Wow. And so you just have to know where they are. Yeah. You know if there's something sticking there in the water right there, right? Right. Yeah. So you know, that's a vehicle over there. Yeah. Did any of them show up on this at all? Anything to show uh, the, uh, only the name on the land. The yellow is right where the land is. Right. So this doesn't show anything in the water? No, only on the land. Wow. So you're sailing land. really by knowledge? Yeah, I've been, I've been doing it for nine years old. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, since the hurricane now, since the cars are out here now, you got a yeah. different route. Yeah. No, I think I mean, the same route. Same route. Just, okay. The same route, but just that some part of the road, you got to remember that sink there in the water. Right, right. You get out in the back there, you get some big trees, the palm, uh, coconut, not palm, pine trees, and you get plenty of other things out there in the water. And you look over for. Wow. Think they'll ever move them? I wish you'd put them too. 
Yeah. I wish they could have been on more by now. But, uh, in the near future, I, uh, plenty of people can get rid if they don't make them underwater. And then you look at it right now, mm -hmm. the fish. You know, you had a problem with poison and fish and things come up in this way, don't they? Be in the water. From eating around the, yeah, eating around the vehicles. That. Yeah. That's, that's a hazard. Yeah, that's a hazard. In good weather, it's a short trip from the dock to Sweeting's Key. On approach, the view from the shoreline tells us just how bad it is, yet the worst is still to come. So many homes, businesses on this tiny key are flattened, many ripped from the foundation and lost at sea, while others are reduced to rubble. What used to be a population of about 120 is now around 20, depending on the day. We are told there are only about four to five houses here that are inhabitable. The rest are gone, uninhabitable, or made into makeshift shelters as a temporary covering from the elements. On the dock, we're welcomed by some residents eager to show us what's left of this once thriving fishing town. One resident later told me this was a town where we made money from fishing. Everyone here lived well. Not anymore. Life has come to a halt. As we sat out on foot on the main road on the small quay, the sounds of a battery-operated radio greets us. It's been two months since the hurricane, and anything here with power is being operated by battery or tied to a generator. It's here we find Leonard Fiesta. The radio keeps his company as he works alone to complete some basic repairs. A lifelong resident of Sweeting's Key, he rode out the storm in his house. He recalls how fighting against the rising floods and wind became a struggle for survival. My experience of the storm was terrible. Um, during the storm, that was uh, over here in this building over here. And um, when it first started, uh, I lost my roof in the back here. Then we consider to uh, get out. By the time as we get out there, we had about two to three foot of water, which we didn't see in the house at the time. And we started making it over by the building over there. Getting over there, we had about four feet in the building. So we just started making the decision, what should we do? And all of a sudden, it just fell off flat count. So I said, hey, let me go and retrieve the boat. We get the boat, bail out all the water, going back into the building in the same water. But we pull the rope underneath the door. And the weather come back down. It's like, we can't stay in the building. We gotta get out of the building. This time you were still in the boat? No, I was in the building. Okay. Um, so we, let me get in the boat. Like they were actually getting the boat right there and then, but we tried to get a door open. We couldn't get a door open like that. So after talking to the four men who was with me, you know, I tell them we can die in this building. Try your best to get this door open, you know. Everybody must have put out the last little bit of strength. The door cracked, and the water blew the door right off the hinges, you know. And coming out that door there, when I opened the door, the water's up to the bell core, so we still couldn't come out, you know. So we got to wait till the water drop a little bit. Then squeeze up over the door jam to get in the boat. Try to lean the boat down as much as you could get it down. Then we get in. Then we walk around the building. Been there till like 3 o'clock. It's a start like 8 o'clock. So when the water started dropping, it started getting more tense. So I got to yuck the button off the window. Try to squeeze back into the building. You know? So it was terrible. So you literally had to go from the outside back into the same building you were afraid of in the first place? Yeah. And then what? Did you remain in there for the duration? Yeah, I remained in there. Mm -hmm. What 
was it like after the storm passed? How hard was it having to survive in those hours and days after the storm? Well, it was hard. It's, the food which you had was gone. The water was gone. Five days. Couldn't find no food like that. No water. You know, so it was kind of hard now. Yeah. And you're back here uh, working. You are planning to rebuild? You're planning to return? You're staying here? Well, I was in the hurricane. I, I ain't moved yet. So, yeah, I intend to rebuild. Yeah. Have you been getting a lot of outside help? People coming in to well, assist? Yeah, we have some outside help. Yeah. Um, they were sorry. At least they bring some supplies and water food. Yeah. What would you say are some of the things you need the most in order to, you know, just get back on your feet and get life back to where, at least partially where it was? Right now, in order to build a house, you need materials, you know. Um, I had a couple of funds that day going in the house. I wasn't expecting for it to happen, but it happened, you know, so it led me to a point, you know, so... Once I get certain things, yes. Further along on our journey, we encountered these Sweetings Key residents in the midst of their own despair. With no home and only a tent as a shelter, they were busy trying to restore those ever so small pieces of their lives. This was your house? Oh, okay. Your house is in the box. This is house. Oh, wow. Okay. House the house. Oh, wow. Your house is gone too. Uh, oh, house is back gone. Wow. So you're just trying to now. You stay in the tent here or? The tent over there. Okay, all right. Okay. So why you decided to stay and not leave? Huh? How come you decided to stay and not leave? We leave and come back because this is our fish, fishing and religion. He's in one between the pool just like that. Okay. You came back to try and get your life back together. Yeah, see, nothing like home. Yeah, no, you're right about that. You're right about that. But it can't be easy, eh? No. Take time. I'm coming, bro. All right. Well, good luck to you, eh? Yeah. Take care. God bless. Next, we visit famous Turtle Pond, a favorite with Sweetings Key residents and visitors here. These days, the benches used for picnics are all but blown away. They're only remnants of a once popular weekend picnic spot and turtle observatory. Luckily, the turtles, the main attraction, have survived, but no one comes here to see them anymore. We passed Turtle Pond on the way to check the conditions of the island's water supply. There is evidence that work is taking place to restore the supply, but up to the day we visited, it still had not yet been restored. We understood the water supplies were expected up soon. No such luck, though, for electricity. Just about every pole on the island is down. And with such a small population, residents say they doubt Grand Bahama Power will be restoring their supplies anytime soon, if at all. Justifying millions for such a small population is going to be a tough sell. Back on the main road, we come to Russell's Seaside Club, and told it was a favorite spot on the island. All that remains now is the foundation and sign. So this oh, was a club? This was a club, a restaurant and bar. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's the slate from the pool table. Oh, yeah, right. That was in there. They take what's B here, can't lift that. Is this your, your mother's home? Uh-huh. Is anyone in here? No, no, she, no one is there. We, we, she went through one. Like I can tell you how, pow how powerful Dorian was. And the further we go, the more stories of survival. 
you left Sunday. Sunday morning. In this. In this. To take some folks, some clients down, elderly people. And after the hurricane over, man is looking for it. This way she was. You took people, but you came back. I came back in the boat. That's the next one there too. One behind it. This is a small one, 18 foot one. I would have I wish on, on the, the equipment to come now so we could cut these up so we could flip it over to so see you, what I could save over there. And you literally can't move anything no, because you just don't have now. the equipment. We don't have the equipment to move nothing with, to move it with. My girls. And when we come back. Tyrone Duncombe is one of few who stayed behind on Sweeting's Key. He now admits he underestimated the storm. He recalls how he had to protect his family and eventually provide shelter to neighbors in distress. It was, it was horrible. It was, it was like a bad dream. Still, right, still waiting to wake up from it. But I uh, wasn't anticipating the way it would have been the way it was. That's why I stayed home with my family. And... It was bad, it was bad, the worst I ever see, you know. The wind came down, the water rise in the house. And, but we never left, my house never really left me. So I stayed inside with the family and we ran right out in there until the water started to go back down. You, know? you were able to shelter some other people who needed yeah, help as my, well? My neighbors came over and we spent the remaining of the hurricane right inside my front room until the weather calmed down, you know. At one point, I understand you had some fish. Yeah, we come. had fishes swimming around in the front room because the water came up this high in the house. We had fishes in the front room, little small fishes swimming around and until the water started to go back down, you know. It was like a bad dream, still, ready, still waiting to wake up from it. At any point, did you think you would not make it out alive? No, I didn't have, I didn't have no fear in my heart about making it alive because I have, I, I suppose I have a lot of God inside of me. I prayed, when I finished praying to my God, all of my fear was gone. And I just I said, right? I told my family, my wife got afraid, the kids, one of my, one, the, old, the youngest one, he told me say he was scared. So after the water started to rise up in the house, she told me, say, man, say, what are we gonna do? I say, I say, boy, we gotta stay inside the house and see how high the water gonna get. So she said, man, let's go outside. I said, no. So after she gets so scared, I say, well, anyway, let's go outside. That's the show her. We come outside, I say, start up on the highest part of the house in the back there, on the, on the thing, right? We stand there for a while. I saw the water came up so far. I wait. So she said, get the ladder to go on the roof. I come around the side, you know. I come back inside, I say, you know what? God on our side. I say, y'all, I say, y'all believe in God? They say, yes. I say, anyway, God and keep us safe. Let's go back in the house. And we go back in the house, I shut the door. We stayed in the middle part of the house. And then when our neighbors came over, we all sit in the front room until it was safe to come outside. What was it like in the days after the storm? Once the weather cleared and you came out and you realized the whole key was devastated. Yeah. What was it like? It was like a bad dream. It was like a bad dream. Never thought it never thought that happened, you know? Because during it during during in the house that night. You know, a lot of things was going on, but I never thought we'd see the key look like this after that, you know? It's the worst we ever had it in my lifetime. What's needed now? What are the things you all need to, 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 to just to be able to live? Right now, we as fishermen, we lost all our boats. We need boats 
to get back so we could get back on the water fishing. That'll help us to build our places back along with other help, you know, but we need our own thing back. So once we get our boats and fishing back, we could make money and we could go ahead and build our places. You know what I'm saying? We need, we need a lot of help with building. You see all the houses gone. Everybody needs stuff to get their stuff back together. You know, that's the main thing. Why didn't you evacuate when people were saying evacuate, come off evacuate. the key, go to Grand Bahama, yes. go to Freeport? Yes. I thought about it, but I, I said, like I said, I spent all the hurricanes in my house. Never had a problem. Never had a, I maybe had a shingle come off, not a plywood, nothing. You know what I'm saying? For all the, all the hurricanes. Jane and Francis, Machu. Machu was a category five. Machu passed, when Machu passed, I was standing right in the road right here. So the hurricane passed. You know what I'm saying? This one was the voice. Was the voice. I don't think it was no category five. Because you know five could do that. Nowadays Duncan passes the time in a tent living room set up on his property. He says he escapes to this space as a means of relaxation as he awaits the next step. Our guide throughout the Sweetings Key journey is Gladstone Russell the island's chief counselor. We eventually make our way to his home where he recalls the horrors of the hurricane and even now the daily struggles of life in a post-Dorian world. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. Which one I'll never go through again in life. Why did you decide to stay as opposed to evacuating, even yourself having evacuated some people? Uh, being the chief counselor, I say, I. I believe I should always be on the key. So that's why it's, I always stay on the key during any hurricane, me and my family. So next hurricane come, God's spare life, category two, we'll be out. It was that traumatic for you? Yes, sir. Were there times when you got out of here and were trying to find shelter that you thought that you wouldn't make it? Yeah. Two, Monday, Monday night, I we, apparently we almost did give up give up but the faith we have God is real so we put all our trust in him and he said he won't fail us but when it get worse what we did we went to my next door neighbor and that's where we, we bought the rest of the hurricane out by him Tyrone Duncan. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the aftermath now the storm is cleared everybody on the key survived fortunately um, but what were those first few days like for you and the people who stayed here? Oh, the first few days was horrible. No water, no food. Everything ran, ran out. We had to get water from the bladder, the water steps in the back there. That wasn't much. It was like yellow, but we had to strain it to drink. It wasn't nice. And when did the, and where did the supplies start coming from when they arrived? The supplies that came in from a, one chopper came over and they saw us and we told them that everybody is accounted for. He said, we must just be patient, help us on the way. When we look, the next day, there was chopper after choppers, just bringing supplies for us. And what happened even after that? Once you were able to get food, et cetera, um, what then happened on the key with the cleanup, et cetera? Uh, the, the cleanup is, as you can see, it's not the way we like for it to be. We need some equipment in. What the folks did every Saturday now, we just come up and we clean. But I have some friends from foreign Conway of Hope. We try to get some uh, equipment in as soon as possible. But I'm, I can be in Freeport tomorrow to make arrangements with the guy who owned the badge so we could get the equipment here to start the cleaning up. Mm -hmm. And... Out of the number of people who lived here, how many have returned and are people returning or just coming to clean up and leave? Uh, they just coming to clean up and leave. Maybe spend like a day, two days, then head back. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, that's what my wife is doing. We're doing the cleanup. So when we finish, then we'll go back, spend another two days, then come back, spend, we spend another week. The government has advised some of you all to consider moving to the mainland. Why will you not consider that? No, no, no. There's no place like home. We cannot go to McLean's stand. That was a suggestion that the DPM uh, mentioned, but the resident didn't, didn't fall for that. When you consider 
all the other areas on the mainland, in Grand Bahama, in Abaco, that have larger populations that need just what you need. Um, do you think that's going to impact the ability to be able to provide you basic things like electricity, water, you know, proper cleanup, um, even supplies to help you rebuild? Uh, that's why you see, as we speak now, I dealing with these foreign guys to get the equipments in here so we could do the cleanup. Now, the rebuilding process, it might take a long time. Because, you know, with friends, they will help. Now, with the electricity, I doubt it for another year, maybe next two years, maybe three years. Before you get electricity? Yeah, before we, get, before we have power on the key. But we decide we'll go with generators for now. But I would like for the folks here to reconsider Let's have a uh, form a corp and do a, a corp on the key so we can have your own power and your own water. So you, you think it's smart for you all to get together and provide those yourself? Yeah, I think it's more bad, more suitable now is because it's been two months plus and there's nothing on, off on the ground moving as yet. Interesting. Um, despite the warnings to come off the key, you said about 30 people stayed, right? Mm -hmm. And do you, do you still think that was a wise idea? No. Now it's not a wise idea. But before time, like my, where we always do, we always ride in the hurricane. We stay here. We, have, we take the elderly and disabled. We take them to the mainland so they can get to the shelter. We have the guys them stay here so we could notice the key. But after Hurricane Darren, I don't think that's going to happen again. I think everybody's going to leave. I know this school is uh, demolished just about as well. Um, where are the children? What's happened to them? And do you think that school will ever be rebuilt and children will be able to go to school again on the key? I don't think the school got to be rebuilt. Not, not the condition it in and the, and the way things is now. And the school, the kids, I don't think the kids will come back into school again. It'll be years, years upon years before that happened. So what's going to happen to the future of the key? If the children don't come back, they are the future... Uh, they are the ones who will carry on life on the key. What's going to happen if kids don't come back? That's why I say we got to form a corporate and see what we could wake, uh, wake out. Because the way, it's, the way it stands now, hope is, is limited. Much like the name suggests, the group Convoy of Hope has brought a spark of optimism to this hurricane-ravaged community. The schoolhouse, which had an enrollment of about 15 students, was all but wiped out. While a physical building remains, there is little left to allow for any kind of learning. This and the nearby administrator's office is where the guys from Convoy of Hope have set up as a base of operation. We're a faith-based nonprofit based out of Springfield, Missouri in the United States. And uh, we're in our 25th year of providing humanitarian aid and uh, different support, different types of support for people in you know, difficult situations. Uh, so a large part of what we do is disaster response, both in the United States and internationally. And of course, Dorian was, uh, what I would call it a historic hurricane. Um, and obviously there's a lot of need all over. And uh, we were hearing reports of a place that was needing a lot of help and uh, maybe not having gotten as much as they needed right off the bat. So, um, you know, through some investigation, we found out about Sweetings Key. And so we've come here to set up and uh, provide help. And tell me a little bit about what you intend to do. I mean, you've set up a camp here, yes, sir. Um, so you're based here. But tell us uh, about some of the work you anticipate you'll be able to do here. Yeah, we plan on helping the, the locals here on the island with some debris cleanup, um, uh, going through their homes, you know, if there's anything they need taken out, we can do that. And then getting into actually removing the debris, the stuff that needs to go. Um, we're hoping, you know, hoping to get some heavy equipment. Um, so we'll see where that leads us. Um, but just meeting the needs of the people where they're at right now. Having, you know, been in disaster zones before and mm -hmm. dealing with these kinds of things, is there anything unique to what you're finding here? Or is this atypical of what you would find in, in disaster spots? Uh, you, the locals are very, you know, upbeat, I think, and positive. Um, you know, I haven't been to the Bahamas before, so, I, you know, that I think is a, a very good characteristic that you don't always find everywhere. Uh, but like a lot of places, they're making the best of a, you know, very difficult situation, so. And, um, you know, 
we look particularly at this complex, you're just trying to bring, uh, normalize this mm -hmm. to make this, what, a distribution center? Or what do you intend to do in what used to be the school? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, we are going to be using uh, the structures for a bit of a warehouse for some of our supplies that we use, need to do our job, but also distribute some supplies to the people as well. Um, you know, we're just getting going, so this, you know, we anticipate this being a long process, though. Back on the mainland, we drive through McLean's town and then into Pelican Point. There are signs of progress. A lot of debris is being cleared away, yet the rebuilding hasn't begun in earnest. The few people we see are still just cleaning up. Far removed from the busy life of Freeport, they carry on without the luxuries of electricity and water enjoyed by so many on the other side of this vast landscape. And when we come back, I'm joined by a reporter and anchor here at RTV who has also been embedded in this tragedy. Stay with us. Hi. Hi. Did you guys make plans to get together? No. This is a... Uh... It's the romance they've always wished for. Would you two have ever met if you didn't come together to help a little old lady? Elizabeth Mitchell and Cameron Matheson shine. So this is what Christmas is supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. I think I like it. The Christmas Club. Only on our TV. And welcome back to our final segment in our final show for the season here on the record. Uh, this episode, of course, is dedicated to looking back at our coverage of Hurricane Dorian, the people it affected, the lives, the situations, the scenarios. In all of our work, uh, we have been aided um, from, with some great material coming from some great people who have worked really hard. One of them is joining me in studio now um, to talk about his experience. Jared Higgs is a reporter and anchor with our news here at RTV. He's been, I call it, embedded in a lot of this um, hurricane coverage, I mean, from the time the storm was passing. Uh, I want to first start by talking about and reflecting on some of those moments for you um, that stood out the most in the coverage of this storm, uh, what it meant to you, um, and working in sometimes some of the most unfavorable um, environments. Of course, you know, uh, thanks for having me, of course, Jerome. Uh, what stands out, I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but of course, you know, the Prime Minister's announcement you know, of the Hurricane Dorian deaths, the initial announcement, that confirmation, you know, I think it's so important before that moment and we think about the fact that Abaco at that time was still going through tropical storm conditions. Um, Dorian had passed and was either you know, hitting Grand Bahama or heading there. And there was still uncertainty and then that uncertainty ended. 
without a doubt, with an announcement from the Prime Minister. You know, before that, there was all this speculation about the impact that the storm had. You know, and I can remember trying to do my own follow-ups and, you know, uh, coming across people telling me that there were deaths, not wanting to believe it, mm -hmm. not accepting, you know, mm -hmm. social media viral posts. I'm not mm -hmm. accepting those. And like I say, so hearing that, that really stood out so much. I remember the evening that happened during the news conference, and I think we... I shared it, and I was like, "Wow, um, this is a new reality for us." You know, at this point, um, as you, I think you were probably the first reporter we sent from Iron into Abaco. You flew into Sandy Point, literally hiked a ride mm -hmm. into Marsh Harbor. Take us back to that moment. You getting on the ground now for the first time. Did you expect it? Did you know what to expect? What did you feel, particularly those moments when you entered into Marsh Harbor? So I can, if I can just take it back to getting into Sandy Point, I mean, this was my first time flying into Sandy Point, so I'm introduced to South Abaco. You didn't even know there was an airport. I didn't even know. I yeah. didn't know really where I was going. I sat in the front of the plane next to the pilot, you know. So I almost felt like, you know, and in a sense I was like a relief worker going in as a journalist to get information. So we get into the South. We're lucky because we meet two customs officers and we get a ride up the road. They make it very clear to us because our return flight is supposed to leave from Sandy Point as well. They said, buddy, if you're coming up to Marsh Harbor with us, you're not getting back to Sandy Point. It's not going to be able to happen. So that's the first thing. So we already automatically had a change in our plans just from that. So we get up the road. You know, the, the road was still very flooded. They had large lakes heading up, uh, you know, in the however long the drive is. Uh, maybe 40 to 60 miles up to Marsh Harbor, past vehicles in the road, past people walking. And of course, when we get into Marsh Harbor, then that's when the reality sets in. The government complex is packed with people. The government clinic is packed with people. Uh, we start to talk to some of the uh, mainly former residents of you know, those migrant villages, the Peas and the Mud, start talking to them. Like I say, at that point, it just the reality all just sets in. If you see that government complex, you know, I can only, again, describe it as the government favela because people, that was where they were living. They were living in the rooms. They had their clothes hanging up on railings. It was the beginning of this new reality. I think people don't always understand the difficulties that we face as journalists now trying to report on this. And the difference, I think, with you and others, this is our home. We're not a team out of ABC, NBC, CNN, and all these other international journalists that just descended upon this, but this is our home. These are our people, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters. At what point did that kick in um, for you when you thought, this is, these are my people? Had to be. I have to take it back to the announcement of, of the deaths because, mm -hmm. you know, in my lifetime, I mean, Hurricane Andrew was when I would have been like one year, you know, I would have been about a year old. I think there were maybe five deaths as mm -hmm. a result of that storm. I believe when I was young, someone died during a hurricane. It was maybe one death. One, even one or two. You, one person would have died. It usually would have been something not directly related. Some, I know there was a time someone got electrocuted. electrocuted. Someone died crossing Fishing Hole Road one time. Yeah. Yes. So you, you're right in that respect. So mm -hmm. it, it, hap it happened, but never to the point where, no, we had, um, you know, Hurricane Dorian killed many Bahamians. You know, it's so sad because we're a country that's grappling with a murder, you know, with a with a homicide problem. A lot of Bahamians kill other Bahamians mm -hmm. for gang reasons, domestic issues, whatever else. And so it's crazy that a storm could come and do, you know, what 70 killers probably couldn't do, right? You mm -hmm. know, a storm, one storm, one day on Abaco. You go from covering a murder where one, the most two people may die you know, in a scenario. If it's three, that's really tragic. Uh, you cover a lot of crime and murder, so you know this. But all of a sudden now, you have multiple deaths and you have a different level of chaos. I want to talk to you about that as well, what you would have experienced in those days at the airport in Marsh Harbor, where you literally had thousands of people trying to get out. And it was Marsh Harbor um, and Treasure Key at that point. But you, you guys were in Marsh Harbor initially. It was chaotic and it highlighted 
the drastic humanitarian crisis that we are still going through right now as a country. Um, everybody was eventually evacuated uh, over the coming days after that Thursday. So the storm hit on Sunday. I got into Abaco on Thursday, and that was the earliest that we could have gotten in. Um, so of course, you know, this, the storm hits, everybody's trying to get out uh, at the airport. You know, I'm trying to get out of Abaco that night or that day. You know, I, so it's your I could, own struggle for survival at this point? My own struggle, because we couldn't get back down to Sandy Point. The relief flights that were taking people out, you know, they had some pe you know, elderly people, people with children, people with injuries. There were people at the airport who still who had injuries. Who had to go. Who had to go. And so, and you know, us too, because I'm thinking, okay, if I have to stay here tonight, I'm going to just be experiencing the realities of, of Abaco. Uh, post Hurricane Dorian in the days after at night, which I thought to myself could not be a good thing. It just it just wasn't boding well with me, and so I only and I mean I, I'm still lucky. I'm sure that you know okay if I had to spend the night there, I would have it would have been rough. I may have not enjoyed it. Next day, I probably would get back home to my house that is still intact, mm -hmm. my clothes, my belongings that I still have that are dry. You know, on the other hand. When we think about these other people, they're trying to get out of Abaco too, just like me. But they're far, they were far more desperate. And the question was, what was awaiting them on this side? You know. um, in the days and weeks and now months since that you returned, um, you've continued with the coverage on many levels and speaking to a lot of survivors. What has that been like, having to endure those stories sometimes day after day. People are still so emotional. The horrific details of you know, survival, having lost multiple loved ones. What has that been like for you and others in this, in this field? I think that it was so sad that so many people who experience tragic loss, you know, loss of life after, or who had you know, a loved one that died, that they seem to have had to get over it so quickly. Mm. That's how it seems to me. Uh, I spoke to Lashan uh, McIntosh, her son Lashino McIntosh, eight years old, and you know uh, when I spoke to her, you know a few days after, you know she, what choice did she have? Because I mean you have to be brave, right? You have to kind of persevere. She had to bury her child, had to cremate. She didn't want to cremate him, but she had to. He came back to Nassau in a state that he, he had to be cremated. And so, you know, she had to just, in a sense, I feel like they just had to get over it. That really bothers me. Another man, Adrian Farrington, his son died during the storm. We went back to talk to him. We spoke to him at the hospital. There's a video on Facebook. You can find it. Uh, he's telling his story just in the moment, you know, in the days after the storm. We go to him like a week later, and the man has, he's trying to move forward. And I just feel like it would just had to be so rushed just because of the circumstances. He told us at that point, a week later, he wasn't even expecting to find his child's body. You know, and it's, it's like, we went through the worst tragedy ever, and the people who are affected by it, it seems as if they've had to get over it so quickly. No, more, no real period of mourning. No real period of mourning. No real, you know, you don't, they, they, you know, usually, even if someone dies tragically, your mm -hmm. loved one gets killed. You know, we don't usually hear, like, there may be a situation here or there where, you know, you can't find a loved one's body. Maybe they get lost at sea. Can't someone maybe gets kidnapped, never mm -hmm. seen again. Something like that. Very difficult circumstances. Because that, that element of closure is what we hear people talk about a lot, right? Yeah. And so we have had to, in many instances, I believe, kind of like remove the element of closure. And I think that it's kind of forced people, because again, they're worried about their loved one who died. But if you're staying at the Kendall Isaac shelter, then you're also worried about, where am I gonna live? Which one do you prioritize? You're probably gonna have to think about where you're gonna live a lot as well yeah. as missing your loved one. Yeah. Very, it's a sad set of circumstances. Um, I mean, no amount of preparation could have really prepared us for this. I don't care how many scenarios we would have run, what we would have done as a country, nothing could have prepared us for this. 
even as journalists, I think we were unprepared for the level of destruction and death. And, and did, and I want to speak to a, you know, a, a, as Bahamian journalists, do you think that we could have done a better job in what we did and how we did this? I, I sometimes just sitting at the desk here in the evenings, in the aftermath, I, I felt as if, I felt overwhelmed as if we couldn't get out enough or couldn't speak to, and it was so many times we didn't know what was happening. Do you feel, did you feel that helplessness sometimes as well? I think, and like reflecting on your question there, I think this is a rare moment when, because you know, editors, um, and for those who don't know, you know, in, in news, the reporters are junior, they take instructions from, or you know, and we mm -hmm. work under editors, so you would be an editor, above an mm -hmm. editor, producer, I'd be a reporter. I think this is a rare instance where the editors didn't have the experience to necessarily guide the reporters. We all went through this. This is a generational and a very broad generational occurrence. You know, no one was around covering the great Abaco gale of 1929. No one was there. And no one was there for that to reflect and say, hey guys, don't forget that this thing can come in and wash us away. You know, not even to mention the fact that climate change has made storms even more powerful. Sure. You know, so it was, that was, I think, a big part of what we were dealing with. It was, you know, our editors weren't telling us, hey, by the way, guys, before the storm comes, be prepared for that. No one told us that. Be prepared for the absolute worst. Be prepared for, and I think that's going to be the message for another generate, and depending on what type of storms we have in yeah. the future. That's going to have to be our message 20 years from now. If a storm is coming, if I, I'm an editor and I have young reporters under me, you know, they should know about Dorian, especially if they were alive at that time, to sure. kind of have an understanding of how serious this thing was. But certainly, from a news coverage point of view, you know, editors yeah. and reporters, we went through this one together, didn't we? Yeah. It, most definitely. And I, I, I think you, you contextualize it so well when you said, you know, um, we did not, this is sort of a generational thing. We weren't prepared, even though those of us who were in the, in the news management side, we were not prepared. We're prepared, we, we know about hurricanes, and we know what's supposed to happen in the aftermath, and, but there were days, there was so much going on, and we were so overwhelmed. You know, I got up at, sometimes in the middle of the night and thought, what are we gonna do tomorrow? And just came in and Jared, we're out of time in the segment, but I, I wanna, first of all, commend you for the great work that you've done. Um, and your colleagues here at, at our news and our TV and you know all of my colleagues in the business It was a steep learning curve for all of us. I think we did the best we could um, With the knowledge we had um, but it certainly I think has changed the landscape You know going forward next hurricane season. We're all going to be in a very different mode But thank you for the for the great work you did um, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so you much, so much. Certainly when we come back, folks, some closing thoughts as we close out this show and, of course, this season. Stay with us. Jesse? Avery? Can the spirit of Christmas bring a chart-topping duo back together? Would Be Christmas is still the most requested song at all my concerts. I avoid our songs as much as I can. Cheney Rose and Rome Flynn star in A Christmas Duet. Only on Our TV. As we prepare to wrap up another season of On the Record, a few thoughts. The events of early September changed our lives in so many ways. No one, not even the most experienced journalists and broadcasters in this country could have imagined or even been prepared for Hurricane Dorian. We made a commitment to keep our focus on this storm from then until now. It's not to say that in the coming year we won't continue to keep this long-term tragedy in focus. But before we say farewell to this season and this year, a special thank you to some folks. Group CEO of Cable Bahamas, John Gomez, and VP of Media, David Burrows, for backing us 
every step of the way. Station manager Alexia Coakley for providing the support we needed at every turn. Valdez Ferguson, who heads our technical team. My technical director, Aiken Barr, who has done an incredible job in putting together these unforgettable images. Cameraman Andre Culmer, and from RTV, Tehran Knowles and Anthony Black, who traveled with me so many times in some of the harshest conditions. Nanette and Joey for the wonderful graphics. My studio director, Kriston Kanye Saunders. My support team of Regina McCook, Eudasia Taylor, and Marcos Ambrister. And finally, the many survivors, experts, and ordinary Bahamians who have supported our work in this effort. We thank you all. We wish you the best this holiday season. On the Record returns to the air in January with a new season, new lineup of guests, and of course, new issues to discuss. Until next time, take care, happy holidays, and we'll see you all in the new year right here on The Record. Good night, everybody.